do you know what the worldwide withdrawal of the AstraZeneca so-called vaccine means? I'll tell you what I think it means. It means that those who locked us down, destroying lives, who pushed jabs as far as they could, all of it under false pretenses, are getting away with it. For those finding cause to celebrate the withdrawal of one product, I say there's no victory because there are no admissions of wrongdoing, no consequences. If we don't face up to that reality, then we will compound our losses by tacitly making plain we accept what happened and furthermore that we accept it will all happen again and likely right soon. The jabbed dead and injured are still dead and injured. Those damaged or destroyed by lockdown still carry the wounds. Those whose reputations were wrecked for speaking out against state policies are still outcast. The businesses that closed are still gone. The piles of profit from the so-called vaccines and from the lousy PPE, mountains of which, useless and never used, are being incinerated. All that money's probably still being counted. The generation of children damaged by lockdown remains damaged. The greatest transfer of wealth in history happened. Job done. The billions that took the jabs remain jabbed forevermore. Those that questioned all along those that were derided as anti-vaxxers, derided as cranks and cooks, none of their abusers will ever have to say they might have got it wrong. Not one word. The many that pushed the official narrative, the pundits that led the ridiculing and destruction, every last one of them remains standing, reputations and earning potential untouched, already rewriting history to disguise their betrayal of fellow human beings and available to do all the same again in furtherance of the next abuse of humanity. For those that publicly challenged the narrative or said no to authority or just asked questions, for all of that, the only victory is knowing we did right and doing the right thing must be its own reward because the louder and most unavoidable truth of all is that no good deed goes unpunished. Those who questioned, those who said no, even now are still being punished because the reality is that while the guilty forgive each other for all they did wrong, those same guilty will never, ever forgive us for daring to question. We will remain unforgiven until the end of time. Let's remember the depths to which the cheerleaders sank, those politicians, TV pundits, newspaper journalists and editors, and actors from A-list to Z-list who salivated at the thought of so-called anti-vaxxers being left with nothing, being denied hospital care, left to die, sacked from their employment, denied access to any public place, socially and reputationally ruined for having the temerity to have a spine and an honest heart. If the guilty could have got away with it, the unjabbed would have been permanently sealed in their houses and forbidden food. That's what so many of our fellow citizens wanted, what so many shouted for. Let us at least remember that. The intention was nothing less than ruin and exile to outer darkness for those who said no. But of course, it was an emergency. We were all in it together. Let's remember all that behaviour, the pleasure taken by the mob in shunning others, banning family members from their homes. Let's remember when so many people were emotionally and financially on their knees, those who preached it was fine to be barred from the bedsides of the dying, from the funerals of loved ones. Let's remember those that thought it right that people lose everything for saying no to an unproven medical intervention, while brothels offered freebies to those that had offered their arm to the needle, while fast food joints remained open and gyms and play parks were padlocked shut. Ah, but you see, it was a difficult time and now it's time to move on, to forgive and forget. All of that happened and those that contrived it choreographed it, are still standing, insisting they were just doing their jobs. Even though it has been confirmed over and over again that Big Pharma and governments knew in advance blood clots from the AstraZeneca jab were foretold, predicted and duly happened. Even though it has been confirmed that Big Pharma and governments knew in advance of the first jab being stuck in the first arm, that those products would not stop transmission, the same stooges stood behind podiums or broadcast via their TV shows and newspapers that it was a matter of duty for every man, woman, pregnant woman, child and newborn baby to take the jabs to save granny, to save all loved ones. 100% effective, take this jab and Covid is over, remember that one. 
It's nothing less than fact that since they knew all of that in advance, that they even had to go the length of changing the definition of the word vaccine, changing what it means, where before a vaccine was something taken to prevent a person contracting a disease, now a vaccine is something to make a disease less hurty. Not only have they got away with all of it, politicians, big pharma, the scientists, the media and the rest rattling with profit, but they have set in place the blueprint which will be used to both justify and enforce whatever abomination they launch next. Let's pause to remember more of what happened, the deaths of so many of the elderly, out of sight in care homes and on shuttered wards, misuse of PCR tests in pursuit of frightening numbers, the disregarding of the fact the average age of death, and no one can deny this, was 83 older than life expectancy, the changing of the way excess deaths are counted so that tens of thousands are still dead, but their deaths are no longer regarded as excess, quite the contrary. Where victims of harm attributed to the so-called vaccines are to be paid compensation, every cent of that money will come from taxpayers. The companies, remember, were granted indemnity long ago, which means the government said that whatever happened, death included, those companies would be held accountable and culpable for precisely nothing. And while we're at it, let's remember furlough, how most people received free money to finance their staying at home, while the self-employed received zilch. Many of those self-employed lost everything, but if they are still with us, having found other ways to make a living, they are required to share the burden of repaying the furlough they were denied, but that was enjoyed by others at their expense. I say again, there's no victory here, nothing whatever to celebrate. The guilty prospered and walked away scot-free while the innocent suffered and continued to suffer, and that's about as much as can honestly be said. It had to happen this way, the dictatorial rollout of the plan, followed by its ending precisely on their terms and only when it suited them, utterly without consequences, for any of them. Because happening this way, rubbing our noses in the fact it all happened and that there will be no consequences for them, manoeuvres or perhaps torments is closer to the mark, the affected populations into silently and humiliatingly consenting to the certainty that when it happens again, we won't be able to pretend we haven't seen it all before and yet demanded no accounting for harms done. If we accept now this rewriting of history, this drip, drip, drip of truth, this absolving of the guilt of so many who caused or celebrated so much harm, then we will have learned nothing. I'm not talking here about the next so-called pandemic, or not just about pandemics. I'm talking about a blueprint that will be followed for the peddling of whatever crisis they dream up next. The existential threats remain bigger than ever. We're still looking down the barrel of digital IDs, of central bank digital currencies, of 15-minute ghettos, of the end of meat on our plates, the end of private ownership of cars, and God knows what else, the end of freedom of speech, in fact, the end of freedom full stop. Ask yourself why governments across the West, around the world, are in overdrive in their efforts to seize control of the internet, to make it a crime to challenge authority, a crime to think, far less to speak freely. Another part of the blueprint is making it illegal to disagree with whatever the powerful say is so. We're still in the shadow of Chinese-style social credit systems, except a version offering more complete control to our captors than anything even the Chinese Communist Party has yet pulled off. Governments hollowed out and powerless, made meaningless. Nation-state governments enthralled to the one and only one world government. Those puppets did as they were told and so used the Covid debacle the so-called scamdemic, to lay the foundations of the digital gulag archipelago that is the real objective. No election anywhere is going to make a shred of difference when every parliament is the nesting ground and breeding ground of the uni party, while everyone was distracted by what I call a scamdemic. I say a pandemic of nothing more than farcical testing, a pandemic of jabs. While everyone was distracted, the World Health Organization rewrote its paperwork to outrank nation states have you paid attention to that one yet? Now the World Health Organization, paid for by software salesman Bill Gates, and despite the suggestion in recent weeks of a climb down, remains poised to lock us down whenever it wants and to take control of whatever it sees fit under the guise of saving the planet, the green agenda, Agenda 2030, which is the daddy of all hoaxes. Here's the thing, people died, like people die every year, of respiratory viruses, but remember, how we were told anyone dying 28 days after a positive PCR test was a COVID death. Remember the vagueness of with or from COVID, all of its smoke and mirrors. 
Now more and more people say the stats show there was nothing new and remember to ask questions about precisely how the elderly died in the care homes. Now more and more people say the stats show it was nothing unusual in 2020, nothing new. Let this sink in. What if all of it, lockdowns, so-called vaccines, destruction of lives, the altering of our world forever, what if it was all done on the back of lies and propaganda? There is no victory here. No one stands accused, except the so-called anti-vaxxers convicted long ago. No one pays a price except the ever-suffering taxpayers milked for more hard-earned cash to make them poorer than before. No one takes responsibility, and as sure as eggs is eggs, the next global emergency is hurtling towards us. And unless we finally wake up, get wise to the scam and say no and mean no, unless we do that, we will only have ourselves to blame. Tom Buick. Hello. Uh, we don't always see eye to eye, mm. neither do we have to. Um, what do you feel? I think for me there was something very telling about that withdrawal of that product and the way it was described, but without any acknowledgement of all that happened. Mm. Neil, as someone that's sat on this couch over what, the last three years, I've been on this journey with you in terms of uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, the vaccine, its efficacy, the role of Big Pharma. To be honest, you know, there are times when you have been the equivalent of a sort of vaccine COVID heretic, and actually you've been proven to be right on many, many issues, particularly the issue of the response to the pandemic and the way in which our government followed China with this very authoritarian uh, lockdowns. I was up for the first lockdown because I didn't know what was going on, but the subsequent lockdowns and the damage to our economy, the damage to our kids and their education, I think that's all now to see. But I've really broken your monologue down into two parts. You know, the first part really is about the role of Big Pharma and whether or not you didn't use these words, but this is how I interpreted it. Um, they're guilty of sort of mass murder. Um, and I think it's important here because, you know, at heart, I'm an academic. You're a brilliant writer and polemicist. But I did want to just look up the figures on the number of people that took a vaccine here in Britain. And I'm one of them, actually. 53 million people took the first, first vaccine, first dose. 50 million took the second dose and 40 million took the third dose. I took all three doses. Um, and I did so because I'm over the age of 50 and I took a a risk-benefit analysis as to whether or not this was a sensible thing to do. Now, you could say the government was cajoling me, it was encouraging me, Laura Dodsworth has written a brilliant book about the state of fear. There was definitely that vibe going around. But was there a universal blanket mandating of vaccines? No, there wasn't. You, I don't know whether you took a vaccine or not, but you had that choice whether or not to take, take that. And on the issues about the number of people that actually uh, lost their lives. And I have to believe, I guess, the Office for National Statistics. It's the only independent agency we have in this country. Um, they're reporting that there are 59 deaths related to all types of vaccine, including the AstraZeneca. That's 59 tragic lives that were lost. There are families attached to that. But I do wonder sometimes when you go on this sort of, you know, go after Big Pharma and you um, don't include you know, the relatively small numbers that actually lost their lives as a result of taking it I, at a time that was unprecedented for I, 100 years. I didn't take any of the products. Um, I Which is your choice. I dis absolutely. I dispute absolutely the figures that you're quoting for consequences from for those well, that did take it. Well, I'm just quoting official statistics, Neil. I, my con but besides all of that, my contention is that we've already seemed to have forgotten that there was no informed consent here because the government and Big Pharma went into it knowing that what they had was not a vaccine, although they pushed it as a vaccine. They had to change the definition of vaccine. They went into it knowing about the adverse reactions that were likely. Pfizer had pages and pages and pages of them. AstraZeneca had seen evidence of blood clotting before mm -hmm. the rollout. We were told that it would stop COVID in its tracks and that more than anything else, it was of paramount importance to take it, not for yourself, but to stop the spread of it to loved ones. Mm. And yet it was known in advance that there was no knowledge about the products stopping transmission because the companies hadn't even been asked to test if that was going to be the result. And on the back of that, all good-hearted people mm 
We're expected to take it. And I think, I think that is what we're already forgetting. There was no informed consent. The people were given something under false pretenses, however well-intentioned the people taking it might have been. I disagree on the idea of there was no informed consent. I made a conscious choice to go for these vaccines. There are others in my family, including younger members of my family, where I would not let them go near the vaccine. So there were choices to be made. Where I agree with you, and it's easy to forget with the passage of time, how utterly authoritarian that whole period felt, you know, living in Britain with the history that you and I share of liberty and freedom and the idea that democratic governments should always, because they're accountable to us, be taking decisions that are in the interest. Sure. That inquiry that we've got underway is there to test that thesis. Just got to get to a break now, before which uh, I, will, I will say the following on behalf of AstraZeneca, uh, a right to reply. Um, we're incredibly proud of the role Vaxzevria played in ending the global pandemic. According to independent estimates, over 6.5 million lives were saved in the first year of use alone and over 3 billion doses were supplied globally. Our efforts have been recognised by governments around the world and are widely regarded as being a critical component of ending the global pandemic. And there's the break, after which I'll be debating whether or not we actually did experience a global pandemic in 2020. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Don't go away. Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show. Who can forget the events of 2020? when people were ordered to wear face masks uh, and to stay indoors for fear of catching COVID. With vaccine safety now in question, some are asking if we really experienced a pandemic at all. Firstly, take a look at this clip of uh, German professor Stefan Homburg using official German data to outline what happened in his country in 2020. For those who are listening to this on radio rather than watching, I will read out the English subtitles. Erstens sank die Klinikbelegung Let's in Deutschland start with the most important things in five key points. Firstly, hospital Allzeit. occupancy in Germany Dr. fell to an all-time low in 2020, says the German Zweitens Federal Ministry of Health. Secondly, there were no more severe respiratory illnesses than usual in 2020 Corona and 2021. Influenza Corona came, influenza disappeared, says the Robert Koch Institute. Thirdly, age standardised mortality was not higher in 2020 than usual. Mortality has only increased since 2021, says the Federal Statistical Office. Fourthly, people who died with or from coronavirus were on average 83 years old. The other deceased were 82 years old, says the Robert Koch Institute and the Federal Statistical Office. Fifthly, Sweden, which was free of masks and lockdowns, fared better than Germany, says the World Health Organization. I'm joined now by Nick Hudson of the group Panda and also author and GP Malcolm Kendrick uh, to consider all of this. Uh, Nick, if I can come to you first of all, it's your contention that there was no pandemic based on an analysis of the data. Can you elaborate on that hypothesis? Yes, hi, Neil, good to be back with you. Um, the, the 2020 signals that we picked up that were so just blatantly stark uh, moving us in this direction were first of all when we saw the mortality rates. Stefan is correct. The average age of death for COVID deaths was higher than the average age of death for non-COVID deaths. But moreover, we could go as far as saying that for even vaguely healthy people under the age of 70, there was clearly nothing in the way of an, a risk additive pathogen on the loose. And that was clear in the second quarter of 2020. And as the year rolled on and we began to see more and more data, another very startling finding emerged. And that was that when we looked at the very granular data, the high resolution data at county level in, in the UK and in the United States, 
what we couldn't detect were the telltale signs called ripple and cluster effects that you would expect to see if what you were dealing with was a spreading pathogen. Instead, what we were detecting were signs of a spreading test, the PCR test spreading into a population where the signal that those tests were detecting was already present and present without any observed severe illness or mortality beyond normal levels. So that was all within the first year of 2020. But over time, a whole lot more data has emerged that call into question the whole idea of whether the story of a pathogen that emerged at a point, whether a point in Wuhan or anywhere else on the planet, planet, and then spread around the world, leaving in its path a trail of death and destruction, was really true. In, in the first place, what's happened is we've seen the results of human challenges experiments. These are deliberate attempts to infect other humans to understand the transmission mechanics of the supposed pathogen. And wherever these human challenge experiments have been attempted, it has turned out to have been impossible to infect other human beings with this supposed pathogen. And so these are all incredibly strong data points which should cause people to pause. Can I just pause you there, Nick? Can I just pause you there and bring in um, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick? Uh, good evening to you too, Malcolm. Listening to Nick there, as I'm, as I'm sure you were, um, what data would you point at uh, to say that there was a pandemic? Well, the, uh, one of the data sources that I've looked at in the past is called Euromomo, which is um, a European organization. It stands for European Mortality Monitoring, I think. And uh, they look uh, over years at uh, spikes in mortality to see if there's some sign of an infectious disease coming along. And uh, if you look at the statistics sort of March 2020, there was a sudden and quite dramatic surge in overall mortality way above the um, uh, all sorts of levels of statistical significance. Uh, it was present more in some countries than others, um, but it was showing widely across a whole series of different countries. Um, so something there was definitely something that happened. There was definitely statistics that showed that at the time. I was looking at them almost on a day-by-day -day basis. So I, I think clearly there was an infection. Well, you can't say for sure it's an infectious disease. There was something started to kill people in higher numbers in March 2020 across Europe. And, and these data, you can have a look at them yourself if you want to. Uh, Nick, that what Malcolm is saying there would seem to fly in the face of the data that you're referring to. Are, are you aware of that data? And how do you react to Malcolm's assertion that there was definitely something new and dangerous in the air? Yeah, we were completely familiar with that data. We were all over it. Um, the, the, re the response that we have is that the, the mortality was not evenly distributed. It, there were a few places in like, for example, New York and Lombardy, Lombardy where we had massively increased mortality. And our, our contention is that that mortality didn't arise because of a spreading pathogen, but because of what are called iatrogenic harms. And for the main part, really deterioration in standards of care that were, were crucial in driving this excess mortality. We do not find compelling evidence that this mortality was associated with the pathogen. It was there. It was unevenly distributed. So, for example, in America, almost all the more excess mortality took place not just in New York State and not just in New York City, but within one borough in New York City. And I'm talking about the excess mortality for an entire country. So that's not what happens with an infectious disease. You would expect to see the same thing happening in Chicago or in Los Angeles or in Seattle. But we didn't. We saw this incredible peak, which we believe was a result of absolutely atrocious standards of care being applied, particularly in a handful of hospitals in New York City. And Hold on there, that had a lot... Hold yeah. on there, Nick. M Malcolm, what about that assertion that it was the, it was the locking down, the, 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 the cutting away of, of people's access to proper care, uh, iatrogenic consequences, as, as Nick's describing? You know, and, and in any event, what about the fact that no one disputes that the, every life 
is sacred. And it, it, but it, people dying at that time were on average 83 years old, which is a year older uh, than average life expectancy. I, I didn't see anyone dying. Around me in my area, I didn't see anyone dying. I saw people locked down. I saw people suffering because they were being locked down. What about the, the fact that it, it wasn't visible without the PCR testing, that it was a pandemic of testing? Um, well, the, I, I disagree with that for two reasons. One is um, I was working in uh, with the elderly population and I saw a lot of people die. Uh, I reckon I calculated at 1.48 was the number of elderly people who I saw dying of what sounded and looked suspiciously like. Well, it was a new way of dying. I have to say, uh, uh, I'm fairly long in the tooth. I've watched a lot of people die. I've been with them when they're dying. I've never seen a situation where somebody could be talking to you quite lucidly, and then half an hour later, they were just stone dead. The other thing that I, I noted was my daughter is actually a junior doctor. She went to work in Bangor and she had to leave her medical um, um, sort of fifth year of studies early to, to work as a junior doctor. She came back to the house. She lost her sense of smell completely and, um, and, and was quite unwell. Uh, our next door neighbors, three of their lads completely lost their sense of smell. I've never seen this before ever in my career. And it became almost pathognomonic to me that, that there was something here that was different I'd never seen before. Now, I don't disagree that, that putting people on ventilators in places like New York, I'm sure that did increase mortality rates specifically in some areas. But to me, I cannot sit here and say there was not a pathogen kicking around that we've never seen before. Hold that because thought. I've Hold never that seen thought. it before. Hold that thought, uh, Dr. Malcolm Kedrick. Have to go to a break, but after the break, we'll be continuing this debate. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GV News. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show. I'm now continuing my debate uh, about whether or not we had a global pandemic of something called COVID. Uh, both Nick Hudson and uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick are joining me, staying with me. If I can stay with you, uh, Dr. Kendrick, um, why, why wasn't it visible without the testing? You're a, you're a frontline carer, but I would, no. I would contend uh, that the experience was that there was nothing to see except the daily reporting by politicians and around the clock about the results of PCR testing? Well, I, I think that um, clearly um, it's very difficult to diagnose a disease if you don't have a specific test for it. And once a specific, specific test comes along, um, these arguments are, 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 I would agree with a number of them, but I, I would say speaking, I was on the ground. I was actually going into uh, nursing homes daily uh, and dealing with elderly people in intermediate care daily. And and the, specifically, I would say, I could tell you that someone was dying of something in a way that I have never seen anyone die before. And, and that was, I wouldn't say every single case. And there were cases where I was trying to get people admitted to hospital and the hospital was refusing to accept them because they said they've just got COVID and we can't do anything. And then it turned out they had other diseases that they, they could have been treated for. And, and then they did actually pass away, which was extraordinarily frustrating. But I, I think it was possible to say, and this person has got a disease, a respiratory disease, their oxygen saturations are dropping dramatically in a way I've never seen before. And then they're just dying. I had never seen this before. So uh, in my mind, I'm 100% clear that there was something different, that something that had appeared at that time. Now, I'm not going to disagree that there were a lot of other things going on that skewed the statistics, but, but I, I, you know, my deathbed, I'm going to say, yes, there was a new disease. It definitely arrived around about March 2020, and I dealt with a lot of people who it appeared to kill. Nick, what about, what about the fact that we, weren't, that we weren't seeing it? And what about the fact that the German professor that we listened to there said that there was nothing in the German statistics, the German data, to show anything out of the ordinary from a clinical point of view? All-time lows for hospital admissions in Germany in 2020 and everything else reading normal. 
where do we, how do we find ourselves in this disconnect with what he was reporting and the notion that people were dropping, like flies that Dr. Kendrick is, is reporting? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's quite simple. When you change standards of care, and it's not just a matter of putting people on ventilators, the deployment of high flow oxygen was a problem, the suspension of the, the routine deployment of, of antibiotics and steroids, those were all problems. The isolation of patients were prob were, was a problem. The, the, the driving of fear into patients was a problem. So there are all sorts of drivers behind this kind of iatrogenic harm. So how do we reconcile this story? I mean, the first observation I'd make is that when we talk to doctors from different places, they describe an entirely different clinical picture. There's no uniformity to this clinical picture. We get one radiologist telling us that there was no difference in the chest scans between the supposed COVID patients and routine influenza-like illness patients and so on. So we get all sorts of contradictions. And really what we're talking about here is this very clear and crisp data-driven analysis of, of Dr. Homburg flies completely in the face of individual clinicians' testimonies. What's the resolving perspective here? We could very well be de dealing with a bad case of confirmation bias. I mean, he, Homburg was clear, no more severe in influenza-like illnesses than usual. Age standardized mortality, no different from previous years. And we know that Germany, according to its own official statistics, had very high levels of population prevalence of this PCR positivity. So, you know, the, the, the data doesn't lie, especially when it's coming from um, official sources who were hell-bent on exaggerating the level of the threat, who actually hired behavioral scientists to drive a, a perceived risk rather than a realistic assessment of risk. Bear with me, Nick, bear with me, uh, Dr. Kendrick. Tom, you like me, we're, you know, we're, we're um, interested observers, to put it yeah, mildly. Yeah. What do you make of this debate and this, and this the, the statistical, uh, the apparent suggestion of the statistics that there was nothing unusual mm. in Germany, let's say, to take an mm. example, and yet still the politicians there decided to shut down their world? Well, it's a fascinating debate, Neil, and I think it's a debate that these various official inquiries need to be having as well with uh, the type of data that's been uh, discussed. And talking to someone that's not a, a doctor, clinical doctor, or an epidemiologist, just the average sort of Joe looking in on this, it can look a little bit like we're sort of dancing on the head of a pin here. You know, was there a pandemic or there wasn't a pandemic? I mean, the Oxford English Dictionary just describes a pandemic as an infectious disease that goes on across the country or indeed around the world. I'm pretty sure this uh, novel coronavirus originated in Wuhan. There's a debate about whether it was a lab leak or not. And it made its way via Europe uh, and uh, eventually around the world and people died. I think that's an indisputable but, fact. But I think, though, the real issue, actually, what I would like to know the answer to is, because, you know, this is where the data points are, are quite important, is um, did our politicians react in a proportionate way? This started in authoritarian China. We saw those terrible scenes, by the way, in northern Italy, the people gasping for breath and health services being overloaded. Did, we get, you know, did our politicians make the right call? Nick, if I can co come back to you, I, 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 I feel the need to, 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 to make something clear, which I think is important. Are we, I, I, is, is, uh, is the German professor saying that, it really irrespective of whether there was something new or not, whether it was deliberately concocted in a lab or not, whether it was released deliberately or accidentally, or whether there was nothing new at all, none of that changes the fact that from a clinical point of view, based on anal analysis of data, everything was clinically normal in terms of people getting sick and dying. Is that not the case? That's the case. There was no unusual risk additive pathogen. And under those conditions, all these other questions become irrelevant. The origin of the so-called pathogen becomes irrelevant. I mean, I, I, I completely contest the idea that something emerged in Wuhan and spread around the world. There is no evidence outside of newspaper headlines for that contention. Nick, I'm going to have to leave it there. Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, going to have to leave it there. Thank you too, Tom, for, you know, for uh, 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 correctly assessing that as a fascinating debate, I think, on behalf of <laughs> those two gents there.
We're into another break, sadly. I'll be joined afterwards by Robert Breedlove, who is a philosopher and a podcaster inhabiting the Bitcoin space. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Don't go away. Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show. My next guest is Robert Breedlove. He is a freedom maximalist. I want to be a freedom maximalist too. He's an ex-hedge fund manager and philosopher on the matter of Bitcoin. And he says his mission is to restore freedom, truth and virtue to our world by tenaciously asking the question, what is money? Uh, welcome all the way from Tennessee, Robert Breedlove, are you there? I am here, Neil. Uh, I can hear you, but I can't see you, though. All right. Well, we'll we will press ahead with voices. <laughs> um, okay. I freely admit, I freely admit, Robert, that I caused uproar in the Bitcoin community last week uh, with a guest who was very dismissive, completely dismissive, in fact, of Bitcoin. Uh, now, I hold no Bitcoin. I don't really have a dog in the fight. However, I am fascinated by Bitcoin, and therefore I am more than happy to redress the, the inequality and invite you to explain what it is about that cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, which makes it, as you see it, the foundation upon which real freedom might be rebuilt. Yeah, Neil, I think uh, for me, I can't speak on behalf of the entire Bitcoin community, but the uproar that was created from my perspective was your guest use of the term intrinsic value. And anyone who has studied economics since the mid 1800s, uh, during which we had the marginalism revolution would know that all value is actually subjective. So value is a matter of individual preference and value is something that is expressed through human action. So I find it farcical and deeply fallacious that anyone would ever use the term intrinsic value. Uh, and it's often wielded as a cudgel to try and dismiss Bitcoin. And what I think they mean by that is that because Bitcoin is not tangible or Bitcoin does not have a commodity or industrial use case, that it is therefore um, irrelevant as a technology and has no use case whatsoever. And that, you know, even if you take that opinion to be true, I would say that the market fundamentally disagrees, right? Bitcoin has a very substantial market capitalization. Um, there's actually a strong argument to be made that its entire market capitalization is due to its utility as money. So in that way, it would be the first pure money we've ever had even something like gold that is predominantly used as money still has industrial use demand associated with it. And therefore, part of its market capitalization is for gold as uh, an industrial metal rather than as a monetary metal. So that was my uh, beef, I guess, with for your sure, For sure, Robert. Is that Why, using something that was dismissed I, 200 years ago. Absolutely. Well, I, I a question that always comes to mind when I when I contemplate Bitcoin is why does its value at the moment, let's say, fluctuate so uh, seismically? You know that you, it it can go, it can it can half in value and and has done in a, in a relatively short space of time, and um, and that that I th that in part is why I, I continue to have questions about its essential nature. Why is it so volatile? Yeah, so the volatility of an asset is always proportionate to its market capitalization. Um, if we looked at, say, Amazon in the early 2000s, between 1999 and 2001, Amazon stock had a 94% drawdown uh, in the wake of the 2000, uh, or the dot-com crash, rather. And it has since grown 40,000%. And today's Amazon, today Amazon stock has a volatility of, you know, in, in the range of, south of 40 let's say so you can think about this the rough analogy is a smaller ship on a larger sea right the waves tend to affect smaller assets which with smaller market capitalizations disproportionately in terms of their price movements but as those assets grow in terms of market capitalization the movements on the sea this being like liquidity movements in the marketplace tend to affect the price uh, less significantly. Uh, 
Uh, another way of saying this is that the the breadth and depth of the the liquidity surrounding that asset as it grows deeper, the volatility dampens. And indeed, this is a pattern we have observed with Bitcoin up until this point. But you have to keep in mind that even today, Bitcoin trading in the mid sixty thousand dollar U.S. dollar price range, it's roughly a one point. Five, $1.25 trillion asset, and it's competing in a $250 trillion uh, marketplace. So the, the market is really trying to figure out, is this thing worth zero or is this thing worth $250 trillion? And the, the less far along it is on that discovery path, the more volatile it will be. Tom Buick, what do you make of Bitcoin? Are you persuaded that it could be the future of money itself, if not freedom? Or, or do you harbour hesitancy about it? I think it's a fascinating innovation, um, the whole distributed uh, nature of it. So it's decentralised. It's not the same as a fiat currency, as it's described. In other words, government owned central banks or private bankers that own central banks. Um, I suppose for me, it comes down to the issue of trust. Um, I think you know he's absolutely right. Ultimately, money is a, is an idea, and it's the idea of of trust. I mean, on our own banknotes, it says, "I promise to pay." That's the essentially the sovereign, the monarch, making that promise to us. On worthless uh, paper. <laughs> well, that's that's a mute point. Uh, on the uh, U.S. greenback, it says, "In God we trust." So it sort of appeals to a higher power. I suppose just practically, as someone who hasn't got a dog in the fight. Um, but has got, like a lot of people have in this country, investments in pension funds, self-invested pension funds in the stock market, in the equities. Yes, I have to ride the wave of the ups and downs in the stock market. But just looking at the figures for Bitcoin in 2021, when it lost 45% of its value. I mean, I think there are people watching this who have got investments, a nest egg, they're saving for a rainy day for their retirement. They would just say, that's not a roller coaster I'm prepared to get on. Robert Breedlove, uh, how many people, I just want a quick question because I'm going, to go into a, I'm going to go into a break and then come back to you. How many people are holding Bitcoin at the moment? Is it possible to answer that question as a percentage of the world's population? Yeah, there's estimates that it's roughly 100 million people worldwide, um, but that, that data is hard to pin down. I do want to respond to, uh, to the critique on Bitcoin's vol volatility once more. You know, any professional investor, anyone that's ever managed money for a living knows full well to call an asset too volatile is nonsense, because if it's too volatile, then you're over allocated. It's just a matter of position sizing in your portfolio. So if Bitcoin at a, you know, call it a 100 vol asset today, if, if you're not willing to ride that roller coaster, if it's creating too much volatility in your portfolio, then it's just a matter of reducing your position size. Maybe that position size is 0% for some people. I'm not here to prescribe. Everyone has to assess for themselves. But to say that an asset is too volatile and, and then uh, say that it should not be, there should be no allocation whatsoever, I think that is a black or white statement about a an assessment that is meant to be done over a gradient, right? The more volatile the asset, and the more conservative you are, the smaller allocation you would want and vice versa. I absolutely understand that fortune favours the brave, Robert, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not prepared to ride the waves, you know, don't go out on the ocean. That's absolutely the case. Mm -hmm. I have to say that at the moment, this is all from me on TV. But to continue with this chat, to hear more from Robert Breedlove, please do go online to the Neil Oliver Show on GBNews.com. Good evening, welcome along to the second hour of the Neil Oliver Show, where I have the chance to have a longer and more in-depth chat with my guests. With that in mind, I'll be continuing my chat from the first hour with Robert Breedlove, a financial YouTuber who believes Bitcoin is the future. And I'll be chatting to Russian politics and history expert Amy Knight, who has written a book, The Kremlin's Noose, shedding crucial new light on the Kremlin's volatile politics under Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin. And finally, I'll be talking to political commentator George Samueli about the current state of affairs in Ukraine and in the Middle East. All of that in the continuing company of my panelist, writer and commentator, Tom Buick. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show. My guest is Robert Breedlove. 
ex-hedge fund manager, but more importantly for me, a philosopher in the Bitcoin space. And he's continuing the conversation that began earlier about money itself, what it means, how we should think about it. Hello again, Robert. What is it, Robert? Hello, Neil. What is it, Robert, that makes Bitcoin, as you say, proof from the interference, the hacking, the control of governments and any other bad actors? I've asked many Bitcoiners this question, but, but I always come away a little bit uncertain. Can you sum it up for me why Bitcoin is as inviolable as you believe? <laughs> Well, the argument would be that Bitcoin is the most battle-hardened crypto asset. Um, it is. It has been attacked via social attack vectors. You could read a book like The Block Size Wars of 2017, in which a group of people tried to create a contentious copy of Bitcoin to increase its block size, and this would have compromised its decentralization. This was an attack that was backed by a lot of very influential and well-heeled individuals and companies. And it was ultimately unsuccessful. And so this was a testament to the decentralization of Bitcoin and its ability to resist even asymmetric attacks. And so how to say that simply is, you know, Bitcoin is really just uh, a, a very simple technology. Ultimately, it is a monetary network that is protected by military grade encryption designed to do two things, and that is to produce a new block of transactions approximately every 10 minutes, no matter how much uh, capital expenditure is being allocated into the mining network. So it's constantly adapting to how hard people are attempting to mine it such that it continues its steady emission of Bitcoin over time. And two, it is intended to adhere to a hard cap, a fixed supply of 21 million total Bitcoin, which will be fully issued in the year, sometime in the year 2140. So Bitcoin is the world's first fixed supply asset. There is no guarantee of a fixed supply of any asset in the history of humanity. Only, you know, prior to Bitcoin, only time and energy themselves were absolutely scarce. And since money is an, a technology that's intended to emblematize time and energy in the marketplace, Bitcoin is essentially the perfect tool for that job and that it, it, it exhibits the absolute scarcity of time and energy itself. Is it, is it can I ask, is it in any way uh, limited or, or uh, by the fact that it is running on 2007, 2008 technology? Which I suppose means it can it be can it keep pace with developments in the world around it? So I don't exactly know what you mean by two thousand seven two thousand eight technology. This is a common critique wielded against Bitcoin. I I don't I don't have a problem with Bitcoin oh, at all. Correct. I just wonder. Software. I just wonder. Is it is it? I mean, for for a non technical person like me, is Bitcoin able to uh, to evolve? Uh, as its environment, as its environmental niche changes? Yeah, that's a great question. So Bitcoin is open source software. So the best analogy for understanding what this thing is, is that it is the internet itself. So we might say the internet is a 1995 technology, but I don't think that would exactly describe the qualities, features, and characteristics of the internet today, right? The internet has evolved significantly over time. Um, Bitcoin has this very interesting model in that it is very resistant to asymmetric attacks, as I just described, but it does retain the possibility of absorbing features that individual users find to benefit their self-interest. So, um, and, and we've so seen some of this, right? There's been like cap upgrades. I'm sorry? So it learns, so to speak. It's, it's, adaptive, it's adaptive, right? It is software. Yeah, but it's, 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 there's an interesting asymmetry where it resists uh, imposed adaptation, if you will, that if someone tries to co-opt the network and steer it one way or another, well, the users are ultimately in power. They're choosing, they're choosing to run the node software that best suits their interest. And that point of social consensus is Bitcoin. So some outside party, again, even very influential people inside of Bitcoin that had a lot of money were unable to sway that social consensus mm. away from, from collective individual self-interest and toward their own. 
Yet within Bitcoin, uh, individual node operators can still update the software in a way that benefits them personally. So in a way, Bitcoin is like the ultimate economic democracy, right? Power is literally in the hands of the people in a way that can't be wrested away by any uh, collective whatsoever. With that in mind, Robert, this idea that it's that it is and always will be in the hands of the people, right? I'll take you at face value there. Mm -hmm. Does the protocol that is Bitcoin offer anything in the way of giving us uh, information exchange, a transaction of information that is similarly untouchable by governments and bad actors. You know, I'm after, would it be possible to use the Bitcoin protocol to have a news channel that couldn't be censored because it's, I don't know, peer-to-peer, -peer, distributed? Do you take it from there? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And money, again, Bitcoin is money. Money is essentially a communications network. Um, as we transact in the marketplace, you know, if I buy a car, I'm telling the economy to, to build more cars. If I sell a house, I'm signaling to the economy to build less houses. And so we are actually communicating our preferences to one another through the medium of money. And Bitcoin allows us to do that in an unstoppable, incorruptible, uninflatable way. Uh, and I, I won't go into the problems of central banking as I do at length on the show, but when you start to print money and you have a, a non, you have a, a monopoly on money rather than a free market uh, solution, you get distortions in this communication aspect of money itself. It causes ca what's called capital misallocation. So you basically get shortages and surpluses um, that, and the market's not otherwise able to resolve these discrepancies. But to your question, Yes. It's, what's interesting about Bitcoin is that we have this unstoppable money that allows us to communicate our preferences without any political interference whatsoever. But we can also write data to these Bitcoin transactions. So what we're seeing today is a lot of experimentation in what's called layer two and layer three protocol technology. So people are actually building new applications on top of Bitcoin that can benefit from the immutability, irrever irreversibility, or censorship resistance that the Bitcoin base layer has, and they can appropriate this feature set for other applications like social media tools, news channels, uh, just chat apps, right? And so we're very early in this developmental phase. Again, if I'm using the, the internet as an analogy, I would say we're in the late 1990s internet years in terms of Bitcoin, right? So over the next 10, 15 years, I would expect to see a lot of these distributed or decentralized applications that are built on top of Bitcoin coming online. Wonderful and I would stuff, especially Robert. expect to see, uh, I would expect, expect to see development accelerate as we see more censorship in traditional media. Wonderful stuff, Robert. This is a, a con an ongoing conversation for me, uh, you know, and I, to be quite honest, I'm a bit geeky about it and I can't, I can't hear enough about it. So I'll hope that you'll come back and continue my education in the wonderful world of Bitcoin. But fascinating so far this evening. Thank you, Robert Breedlove. It's a break, after which I'll be joined by an expert in Russian history to talk about Vladimir Putin's bitter feud with the oligarch who made him ruler of Russia. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. I suggest you don't go anywhere. Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show. My next guest this evening is Amy Knight, an expert in Russian history and an author. And her latest book, The Kremlin's Noose, tells the story of Vladimir Putin and the oligarch Boris Berishovsky, who forged a relationship in the Yeltsin era. Uh, the relationship fell apart. Uh, Berishovsky was exiled or fled to Britain. Uh, he campaigned to topple the Kremlin and was later found dead in a London mansion. Fascinating stuff. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you for having me. No, it's a treat. It's a treat. Uh, what is, what was the relationship between Mr. Putin and uh, his sometime friendly oligarch? And why should we pay it attention now? Well, I'll, I'll address your, the second part first. And that is that I think we uh, we in the West, particularly given the conflict that's going on in Ukraine, uh, we really need to understand 
the person who's making all the decisions right now for Russia, and that's Vladimir Putin. So I think that when we look back in history, and uh, in in my book, I tell the story of the relationship between um, Mr. Putin and, and the oligarch Boris, Boris Berezovsky, as you mentioned, I think that it's um, it gives us a better understanding of how he came to power, how Putin came to power, and what kind of leader he is today. We're told all the time that there's no democracy in Russia. Uh, and we're, I, I happen to believe that there isn't any meaningful democracy really much left in the West either. But given that Putin runs Russia in a particular way, with a personal style, is is he popular with most Russian people or not? You know, that's a que- that's a very good question, and it's one that people ask all the time. There are opinion polls that are independent in Russia, and uh, the the real question is when people respond, you know, are they are they telling the truth? And I think there are some um, some accurate polls. And I think people, because they're anonymous, they they do tell us something. And I would say right now that most people will, and we're talking about the average Russian citizen, supports Vladimir Putin. But interestingly enough, when they're asked about the war in Ukraine, more than 50% say that they'd like to see peace talks. So it's sort of a balance. And I also think that one of the reasons that, um, in my opinion, that Vladimir Putin has this public support is that the Kremlin really controls all the media. And a lot of people just watch television and they see only one version of what's going on in the world. So I dare say that this kind of isolation that Russians have makes them much more um, open to Kremlin propaganda, which is that Mr. Putin is the best leader in, you know, in Russian history. And to get back to your book, what do we learn about the man Putin is and his uh, style of leadership from that relationship earlier in his career with that particular oligarch? What do we learn? Well, first of all, it, it's interesting. If, if you read my book and you look at the story of Mr. Putin, he was really uh, kind of a non-entity. He wasn't a big uh, super KGB uh, intelligence officer. He was in the KGB, but he was a very ordinary man without great characteristics that that marked him for for success. And um, if you if you look at how it happened, you'll see that basically. Uh, Yeltsin, Berezovsky, all the other people who were part of that political uh, leadership or entourage in the 90s, they thought that um, by taking someone like Putin, they would be able to sort of control him afterwards. And once he became, uh, uh, once he took Yeltsin's place, it became the successor to Yeltsin. And I think what we learn is that Putin, of course, can't be controlled in that way, and that he's very, very good at sort of hiding behind what his his real motives are. And I, I think his his real motive, if you look at it, of course, money, they all, I mean, he wanted, he has huge amounts of money, um, but power. And I think right now, if somebody were to ask me what is Putin's driving force behind the conflict in Ukraine and everything else he does, he wants to stay in power. Amy, does Putin run the Kremlin Russia as an autocrat or are there people around him, visible or in the shadows, that he has to keep on side? What, what is his, his leadership style in that sense? That's a, a good question. I, I would say that um, Putin is surrounded by a loyal call or subordinates, but he is deaf. And these, some of these people are like Nikolai Patrushev, who used to head the FSB. Um, he's known, known and he's very important. He's the secretary of the Security Council. 
Um, he's known Putin since their days in Leningrad, way back when. I think sometimes people say, oh, Mr. Patrushev is calling the shots. Or, And even if you'll recall when uh, Litvinenko was poisoned in London in 2006, the conclusion of the British inquiry was that uh, Patrushev was the one who orchestrated the murder, may, sort of maybe Mr. Putin. I would only say one thing, and that is that Mr. Putin calls all the shots. And these people may not even be that happy about what's going on. But uh, yes, <laughs> the short answer is he's an autocrat. Bear with me, Amy. I've got, uh, my guest in the studio, Tom Buick. Tom, we are told a certain line about Putin, are we not? You know, to some extent, our media portrays him as the, you know, the devil incarnate in many ways. And yet he would appear to have popularity at home. I think that's undeniable. What's your reading of the, of the, of the truth of Putin and Russia that presumably lies somewhere between the two extremes? Well, regardless of what our pluralist media, and I think Amy makes a good point here, I mean, we do, you know, for all its faults, Neil, we do have access to a plurality of media, both on in, in these shores and overseas. So, uh, you know, fair-minded people can make their own mind up. That is not the case uh, in Russia today. Putin controls the media, he controls those around him, uh, he controls the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, we've got to make uh, that point. What I find fascinating, and I'm sure, by the way, Amy's book will be top of the reading list for our uh, military uh, people who will be trying to get an insight into who we're dealing with here, although I'm sure they've got pretty, pretty much their own intelligence too on that point. But what I find fascinating just about the whole Russia story, and you saw that with the um, Tucker Carlson interview, the only interview he's given to anyone who's might be vaguely termed a Western journalist, is he's steeped in this history of Russia, going all the way back to Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, this idea that Russia is a great imperial power and it's only due to the West that's got in the way of uh, Russians' uh, potential. I think that appears to me the narrative that he sells to the Russian people, which might explain why they support him. Amy, Tom raises a, a good and, and interesting point there. Uh, does he not? I, when I watched that interview between uh, Mr. Putin and, and Tucker Carlson, I was struck by the way uh, Putin came across as a, a man very much embedded in his country. He, he certainly was able to sell himself as knowing a great deal about his country and being determined to stand up for Russia in a way that I don't think any of our leaders in the West are capable of doing. They all look a bit limp and a bit wet by comparison. You know, he, he, is, he is impressive in that regard. Mr. Putin has evolved. And uh, remember, he's, he's just starting his fifth term as, as Russia's leader, and he's learned a lot. And he's had a lot of very good advice from people who tell him how to, how to you know, behave with the media and so on and so forth. So I think he's certainly skillful. But uh, and and yes, the the narrative that we're you know this is Russia's great history and the West is trying to um, undermine it and Western values are are so corruptive. And I might add another thing: there's always this religious element now that Mr. Putin introduces. Um, when he was inaugurated, he had the patriarch there and he had a church service. You know, I I I have to say, and maybe I'm cynical. Um, a lot of this is for the consumption of the public. I, I said earlier that I think Mr. Putin's main secure is uh, main goal is staying in power. And I think at some level, any leader who is not elected democratically. Thank you, Amy. Fascinating insights there about a fascinating character in the form of Vladimir Putin. A break is upon us, after which I'll be joined by political commentator George Samueli to chat about the latest developments in Ukraine, in the Middle East, uh, and more besides. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. My next guest this evening is political commentator and academic George Samueli, joining me to talk about war around the world, it feels like, at the moment, uh, and to contemplate what we might expect next with a, in a constantly changing picture. George joins me now. Good evening, George. Yeah, good evening. 
Delighted to have you back, uh, George. Um, Russia. Russia now has two countries on the border uh, supplied with long-range missiles. Uh, and our Foreign Secretary in the UK, David Cameron, publicly absolved himself and therefore Britain of any responsibility for how the weapons might be used. How does that go down in Moscow, do we think? Uh, I, I didn't, didn't hear the question properly. Sorry. Russia has two countries on the border supplied mm -hmm. with long-range missiles. Uh, David Cameron, the British mm -hmm. Foreign Secretary, has absolved himself of, and therefore Britain, of any responsibility for how those weapons might be used by those countries. How will that development go down in Moscow? Well, the, the problem is that um, the um, Western powers, uh, the UK uh, and France, uh, continue to escalate uh, the conflict and um, they are now saying and doing things that would have been unthinkable just um, a year ago, because if, let's recall, they had drawn a red line in the past. They said, well, uh, we will provide missiles as long as these missiles are used on Ukrainian territory. But now um, they're, they're saying, oh, well, that's fine. We'll provide you with missiles and you can use them on Russian territory, and that means you can use them in order to kill Russians. And that would have been thought un uh, unthinkable just uh, a little while ago, the idea that British missiles uh, are going to be used in order to kill Russians, and the British government and the French government continue to insist on an absurdity, which is, well, we are not a party to the conflict, so therefore it's inappropriate to uh, reta retaliate against us because we're just not a part of the conflict. You know, so we're providing missiles in order to kill Russians, but you can't retaliate against us because we're not part of the conflict. It's a reckless, stupid uh, way of going about it. Russia so far has been very patient, but you can't count on that indefinitely. There will have to be a point at which Russia is going to say, well, we're getting tired of this. We're getting tired of uh, you, you providing missiles in order to kill us. When we last spoke, George, it felt as if World War Three or, or, or a nuclear confrontation was, you know, was, was closer than anyone would want. But here we are and it feels closer yet. We keep making these, I don't know, asymptotic advances towards World War Three without ever actually quite getting there. But as you say, how much more uh, of, of, of Mr Putin's Patience can the West actually take for granted? Well, the, the, the problem is that um, Russia, you know, wants to avoid um, a war with NATO. Russia has gone out of its way to avoid this war. The problem has arisen that I think Russia has been too patient and has allowed the key NATO powers, then that means the UK, France, um, and the United States, to think that they can go on getting away with this indefinitely. Um, and so they've been kind of constantly pushing um, the, the, on the red line and saying, well, we can do this. We can uh, go on um, uh, you know, attacking a Russian territory. We can go on killing Russians without any repercussions. And what has happened is, in a sense, the theory of deterrence has broken down. Because if you recall, the, the, the theory of deterrence was, well, we don't mess um, with them. They don't mess with us because they have nuclear weapons. We have nuclear weapons. And you know, if, we, if we start messing with one another, then we're going to have a, a global nuclear conflagration. That was the theory of, of nuclear deterrence. But now uh, the NATO powers have decided, well, Russia is more afraid of us than we are of them. Russia doesn't want to escalate. Russia doesn't want to uh, get into a, uh, a military confrontation with us. So we can go on uh, crossing Russian red lines without any repercussions because Russia doesn't want to get involved in a nuclear exchange. So in a sense, the theory of deterrence has broken down, but that's, that has very dangerous consequences. Tom Buick, is it malevolence 
Or is it is it conceivable that the, the leaders in the West, you know, including Sunak, Cameron, Macron, are they are they foolish enough to misjudge the Kremlin to the extent that they actually step into World War Three by mistake? This is a this is a very dangerous game uh, for sure. Uh, you know the Cuban Missile Crisis, Bay of Pigs. These are all recent history of where this planet of ours nearly came to mutually assured destruction. Where I take some issue though with what George has just said, I mean, let's just take the point about theory of deterrence. I mean, yes, that works if you have sovereign states in an international rules-based system, members of the United Nations, and in Russia's case, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, actually honouring that rules-based system and not encroaching on the sovereign ter territory of a neighbour, in this case, Ukraine. So what is going on here in Ukraine? But, this is a defence of a sovereign country in but, Europe, one of the, well, the largest country in Europe. And what we're doing as a, a Western power with other Western powers in NATO is arming the Ukrainians to win this war against Putin's it, aggression. Hold on, Tom. Let's not forget in, about encro that. Encroaching on territory. You, since, the, since, the, since the wall came mm. down, NATO has advanced a thousand miles towards Moscow. Now, you can make all the arguments you like about each one of those being a sovereign state, but, but nonetheless, you, you then have to contemplate that uh, the, the, the US with Victoria Newland uh, fomented a regime change, a coup in Ukraine, o ousting a democratically, maybe not to our tastes, but a, nonetheless a democratically elected leader in order to put in someone that was more to, in, 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 uh, to the satisfaction of Washington. Mm. Mm. You, you know, to characterise the US or NATO as, as behaving well in what you call a, a rules-based system, I would say is stretching credibility a long way. But the point is, Ukraine is a sovereign state. Actually, we were signatories, along with the US and Russia, to the accord that guaranteed that sovereignty, which is one of the reasons why Ukraine, of course, one of the main reasons why they gave up their own Soviet nuclear weapons that were stationed on their territory at the time. 2014, Putin obviously invades Crimea. The response, frankly, was weak at the time. I take the view, however, that if we let Putin win this war in the heart of Europe, who else is he going to go after next? George Samueli, uh, I'm sure you're listening to what uh, my guest Tom Buick was saying. I, I would contend that Russia, in all the ways that matters, has already won this war. What say you? Well, this is a, the thing that um, what the Western powers have done is thrown out of the window the theory of deterrence. So the theory of deterrence was a theory. I mean, no one had ever tested it, and that's what that was good about it. No one really tested whether uh, deterrence works or doesn't work. It was just assumed that, you know, if you have nuclear weapons on one side, nuclear weapons on the other side, then basically everybody stays out and not try to um, uh, get into a confrontation with the other. But in this case, um, despite all the warnings that President Putin has issued and, and saying, well, you know, it's, it's, this is an existential matter for us. And according to our uh, nuclear doctrine, um, we will use nuclear weapons first, obviously in the case of a nuclear attack on our territory, but if we have an existential threat to our country, he made that clear. In other words, it could be an existential conventional threat to our country. We would be prepared to use nuclear weapons. He has said this. And nonetheless, the uh, Western leaders have gone on recklessly um, pouring in weapons uh, on Ukraine and telling the Ukrainians, well, do what you want with them. We're not going to put any restrictions at all on how we use these weapons. I see and that. so therefore, they're essentially this, uh, playing a very dangerous game. I, I ask again, though, George, surely Russia has already won the war. What, what, what I find absolutely astonishing is the way in which America, well, it's not astonishing, I think it's cynical, the way in which America and Britain are continuing to pump money through that charnel house of Ukraine, when all the indications from sage military advisors seems to be that the, the objectives that, that the Kremlin set out to achieve have been achieved, that they're throwing good money after bad.
Yes, they are throwing good money after bad. The, the problem is that uh, they have no plan beyond trying to keep this war going as long as possible and trying to kill as many Russians as possible. That's essentially their strategy because they haven't presented any kind of a plan of what, what sort of a peace agreement they would deem acceptable other than Russian capitulation. So when, when the, the official position of NATO, the United States, the UK, is the Zelensky plan. But the Zelensky plan is no kind of no peace plan at all. The Zelensky plan involves the capitulation by Russia. Well, that isn't going to happen. And one has to say, the NATO powers know that it isn't going to happen. So it's essentially, well, let's keep this war going. And of course, it is sunken treasure. But there's a lot of money. I mean, you know, the United States can always come up with money to wage wars. It's never been short of money for waging wars. And so 60 billion um, a, a month or so ago um, that Biden managed to get out of Congress for Ukraine. Well, there's probably another 60 billion down the road towards the end of the year. There's always money to fight wars, but there's never any strategic goal in mind other than, well, let's keep this war going for a little longer. George, if I could invite you to consider the situation in the Middle East, I wonder what you think. Uh, is Israel's position in the world strengthened now or weakened by the events in which it's engaged? Well, I think it's uh, very much weakened because um, the consensus that had supported uh, Israel in the United States, because Israel has only been able to do all the things it's done over the years, uh, you know, committing the uh, extreme violence uh, and inhumanity over the years, because of the unconditional support provided to it by the United States. That consensus has gone. And what we're seeing in the, uh, the campus protest and, uh, and you know, uh, protests in other places, and it has spread to Europe because everything that starts in the United States then spreads elsewhere, it spread to Europe. So now there is this, uh, for the first time in many, many years, a serious criticism of uh, Israel. Now, the, the Israel lobby is very powerful and they're able to mobilize um, their supporters. They're able to mobilize these uh, talking points about the Holocaust and World War II and Nazis, Hitler and so on. Um, but it isn't working. And so therefore, um, there is now a re-examination on the part of young people who really hadn't taken much of an interest in the Middle East. There's a re-examination of the issues of the Middle East, the uh, creation of the State of Israel, the uh, 75 years of uh, war uh, that followed the creation of Israel. And they're re-examining it. And I think that um, that has severely uh, weakened uh, Israel's position. It, um, it, it's uh, exactly as I, I would say, it's, it's probably not a, 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 a story since the, since the foundation of Israel that, that, that perhaps bears that kind of close scrutiny. That was, that was probably a story that was best left unconsidered, especially by younger generations who almost by, by definition tend to be uh, uh, inspired by thoughts of peace and, and not invasion that's, and war. That's exactly right. Um, because most people just didn't know very much about it. Um, they, you know, there have been years and years of propaganda in the mass media, which is that Israel are the good guys, they're like us, they're kind of white, civilized European people trying to live a you know, calm, quiet, peaceful life like we all do. And they are beset by these savages, these terrible Islamists and horrible uh, people who don't want peace, who just want war, and uh, you know, they, they live for hatred. And then suddenly people are kind of re examining it and, and are thinking, hey, that isn't. Uh, the reality isn't quite the way we were told. There's rather more to this story than uh, we have been uh, let on. And so when, when they look into the, um, uh, you know, the foundation of the state of Israel, and then we can go on. I mean, it's not just what happened in 48, uh, in 49. 
but the, the innumerable wars that Israel has provoked, the innumerable uh, peace uh, deals that were on the table presented by these extremists who were, who were, who were ready to work with Israel, you know, going all the way back to the 1950s and uh, NASA and, uh, and then, you know, the, the Saudi Arabia, Saudi peace plan. And you can know, just go through all of these peace plans. Israel has rejected all of them. Could we, and, could we, uh, George, could we, could we actually be looking at a situation in which Israel is actually facing an existential threat of, of its own making? I think so. I think so, because if that consensus that has supported it for so many years, that the uh, unconditional support from the United States, if that um, is uh, challenged, then I think Israel is in a lot of trouble because uh, the United States has managed to coerce its, uh, I, I wouldn't say their allies, but its, you know, its, its client states in the West into going along with U.S. policy, going, you know, and something that you know the Europeans in particular were not very happy with, but they went along with it just for the sake of going along with the Americans. If, if suddenly the Americans get fed up with it, and it can always happen, it was always a, a possibility that America was just going to get fed up with this, then I think Israel is in a lot of trouble. Uh, because then it really cannot rely on anyone in the world uh, uh, to stand behind it and and, uh, and give it unconditional support. It's it's been dependent for decades on this uh, uh, e extraordinary commitment by the United States, contrary to American national interests. The smart some of the smarter presidents in the past said this is contrary to our interests. We have many geopolitical interests in the Middle East. And our, our um, you know, un unconditional backing of Israel stands in the way of that. And once American leaders think that, then I think Israel is in a lot of trouble. George Samueli, thank you so much for your insight. Time is against us, as it invariably is, but thank you so much for joining me. And I will look forward to further insights uh, if that is the case that the Third World War is still held at bay. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News.